I said, if you have your Bibles, open it up to 1 John. 1 John. We're going to continue to go through you know, our, our, the basic Bible doctrines uh, that we've been going through. Uh, we talked about you know, salvation. We've talked about the fact of you know, backsliding. And this week we're going to talk about you know, something that I, you know, that I know that, uh, for the most part, I think everybody likes, fellowship. I'm not talking about lunch. 1 John chapter 1. The Bible reads, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our, eye, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Who is he speaking of? He's speaking of Jesus Christ. John the Apostle is the one that is writing this. He is saying that, you know what, we've seen him with our own eyes, we've heard him, we've touched him, you know, we know who he is. It, it, he wasn't a figment of our imagination, right? Verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which uh, was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also uh, may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his, uh, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in a darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin." If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit this morning, that as I preach your word, that uh, the seed of your word would fall upon uh, fertile uh, soil of our hearts, Lord. God, that you would use my voice, that you would strengthen my voice to be able to convey this truth, uh, these truths uh, this morning. And Lord, I, uh, I pray that every person uh, uh, within the sound of my voice, that you would give them ears to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, the title of my message is Fellowship with the Father. Fellowship with the Father. Now, fellowship, like I said, is a word that we like. We like that word. Oftentimes, we think of, hey, we're going to have a time of fellowship. You know, let's go get the you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the casseroles and, you know, and, and the crock pots and everything else, and we're going to go have lunch. And it, it, it always sounds nice when we say that we're going to have a time of fellowship, but in truth, the word fellowship means things held in common. Things that, when you are fellowshipping with someone, you are, you know, having, you know, a time where you're holding things in common. You're usually talking about those things that you have in common. Like, if you sit down for a while, um, you know, uh, you know, some of you may sit there and say, I'm going to talk about, you know, classic cars. Some of you may start talking about the news. It's always that time of fellowship you have is something that you have in common, right? You don't sit there and, you know, start talking to somebody, you know, about, you know, cars that has never, you know, really worked on a car or doesn't have any desire to hear a car, you know, you know information about a car. But, it, you know, like I said, it implies standing get together on common ground. Imagine the glory of this statement. God desires to have a close personal relationship with you where you and God stand together on common ground. God wants you to have fellowship with him. Doesn't that sound good? However, to many, it, it seems impossible. You know, John, who wrote this letter, didn't think so. In fact, he tells us exactly how this can take place. He shows us how close communication or communion and intimate fellowship with the Father can be the normal Christian experience instead of some mystical thing that we only hear about or see in other people's lives. Last, like I said, last Sunday we dealt with the matter of backsliding or sin in the life of the saint. You see, a true believer can slip and fall into sin, but there is always a desire for a quick recovery, or there should be. The Christian will not be happy or satisfatisfied until the situation is dealt with and, this, uh, and the sin uh, made right with God. 
a person that has, you know, that has backslidden and all those things, nothing is going to make them happy. Because of the fact is, is that their relationship with God is broken at that moment. It does not mean you know, that they've lost that, you know, that salvation. It just means the fact that that, that communion that they had, that intimate relationship they had, you know, has been broken. It's kind of like the fact of if you get into an argument, you know, like parents, if you get into an argument with your child and your child doesn't talk to you for a couple of weeks, what has happened? That person is still your child, right? But fellowship, that relationship has been broken until, you know, bo- uh, you know in- until, you know, whatever party, you know, was wrong comes to, you know, says, you know, I was wrong and you try to mend that relationship, right? It's the same thing that, you know, that we're, uh, that we need, you know, uh, with God as well. So here's what happens. When a Christian sin, he breaks fellowship with God, but praise God, there's a formula for restoring and maintaining that fellowship day to day. So allow me for the next, you know, for the next you know, few moments to tell you, to share with you of how to experience this fullness of joy that John talks about and refers to in verse 4, where he says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. God wants you to live a joyful life. Amen? Doesn't he, didn't he say that he wanted to give you a life more abundant? He wasn't you know, making that up. It wasn't just a nice little saying that he just kind of threw in there and tossed in there, right? So I want to show you from these verses uh, how you can draw near to God and, and remain there in sweet, wonderful fellowship. So uh, there's, there's five steps that I want you to, you know, to, uh, that we're going to see this morning. Number one is this. We must recognize our sins. We must recognize our sins. John talks about this in verses 8 and 10. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word, his word is not in us. True fellowship with God hinges on our ability to admit our sins. We must own up to it. We cannot say, you know, no, I didn't do that. God knows who you are. He knows what you did. You can't lie to him. You can't say, no, I never did that. I didn't sin or whatever. God knows you did. So why are you trying to get away with it, right? God forgives sins, but it must be admitted before it can be forgiven. It can't just be you know, implied. We can't just sit there and go, yeah, he knows, and just move on. No, the Bible says that, we, uh, you know, that he forgives it, but we must admit it. The world's attitude concerning uh, sin is this, covering it up, never admitting that you were wrong. Or you blame it on somebody else. That's what the world does. The world blames it on somebody else. You know, uh, you know they'll say, no, it, it wasn't me. I only did that because of this person. This person made me do it. By the way, nobody makes you do anything. You choose to give in. Right? They look at, they look at sin as it's not against God. And they, and they wouldn't even, you know, nowadays they, they don't and they won't call it sin. They'll be like, oh, I just messed up. I had an oopsie. Or whatever they want to call it. But nowadays more and more people are saying that there are no absolutes. So where you could say, you know what, you're wrong for lying, for, you know, like, you know, I could sit there and say, well, Alicia, you were wrong because you lied to me. And then if she wants to go the way of the world, you know, she could sit there and come back and say, you know what, I don't think it was a lie. I just gave you misinformation. Now, my wife wouldn't do that. I just want to let you know that. But the thing is, is that that's what people, no, it was just misinformation. I wasn't completely informed or however they want to, you know, spin it nowadays. And they'll tell you that there is no absolute, like, what's right for you, whatever works for you is good for you. But whatever works for me is what works for me. And you know what? The Bible is absolute. It is an absolute truth, and the thing is, is that we need to follow what the Bible says and not the fact of trying to not deal with our sin. And some will just say that, you know, uh, they'll look at it and say, well, you know, it doesn't exist, but we know that what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. There's not one in this room that can sit and say, I don't have sin. There's only one person that can say that they don't have sin, that's Jesus Christ, and you're not God. Galatians 3.22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. 
So what is he telling? He says, all are under sin, but we have a promise. What's the promise? Salvation. How do we get it? By believing on him, putting our faith. That's what it even says in that verse. It says, you know, that the promise by faith of, uh, by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. He says, but you know what? Before that, he says, all are under sin. Because we like to point the finger at other people, don't we? Ecclesiastes 7, uh, 7.20 says, For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. So anybody that says that they're without sin, they, they need to read their Bible because the Bible continually tells us, you're not perfect. I know that, you know, men, you feel like you married the perfect woman, but she has her flaws, right? I mean, very small, right? But she does have her flaws, right? And the thing is, is that oftentimes people will say, um, that, it, uh, that what we did was an accident of an evolving man. Because they believe in evolution. So but this is obviously totally opposite of what God says. Man did not evolve. But man devolved from the image of God into sin. Now think about that. Man did not evolve. We're not, we weren't apes at one time. I know, ladies, sometimes you look at your husband and go, man, that guy's an ape. Big hairy baboon, whatever names you want to give, be nice. But man did not uh, evolve, he devolved, in other words, he went the, the wrong direction, he devolved from the image of God into sin. We see this in Genesis 1.26. In Genesis 1.26 it says, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, let uh, them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all, uh, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. It went down from the hill from there. God gave us, he says, let us make man in our image after our likeness, showing you know, uh, you know, the tri- uh, that he is a triune God, because why would you say our image and our likeness if, there, if there's not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? But some people will say that, but but look at what he says. He says, let them have dominion over all these areas. God originally designed for us to have close, intimate fellowship with him and ruling over this earth. And then sin entered. And we've been going to... See, people, you know, what evolution will teach, and we'll you know, talk about this here in a, little, in a moment, evolution teaches that man is getting better, not worse. That things are getting better. Well, I have a truck out there that has rust on it. It's not getting better. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's rusting. Man is not getting better. We're actually getting worse. The farther we've gotten away from God, the worse that it gets. Think about it. Adam and Eve had that perfect relationship with God. They didn't know what, you know, uh, what life was without fellowship until they sinned. They had that constant relationship. I mean, the Bible says that they, that they walked together in the cool of the day. I mean, all these things the Bible talks about, of how this constant fellowship, this you know, communion that they always had, and then sin came in, and then God had to banish them you know, from the garden. So that fellowship, that relationship was broken at that moment. Before sin can be dealt with, it has to be seen as an offense or an insult to God. Do you know when you sin against God that it, it is offensive and an insult to God? Why? Because you're saying that, God, I can do it better without you. Until sin is recognized as a personal attack on God himself, it can never be forgiven and there can never be real fellowship with God. If you don't deal with your sin, you're not going to have that fellowship that you did when you first got saved. I remember people say, well, you know, it just seemed like I was closer to God. When I first... Yes, God was closer to you. Why? Because, then, uh, because you, you, you asked God for forgiveness. He, he took all your sin, and everything was good, right? But then you allowed, you know, then you allowed sin to you know, come in, and you let it, to set, you let it settle in, in, into your life. That's why after a while, some people say, well, you know, I don't, I don't, you know things don't seem the same as they are you know, uh, when I first got saved, because you've allowed sin to settle in. Oftentimes, you know, people will go to, uh, you know, self-help, uh, self-help movements. 
or guilt you know, treatment you know, techniques, they go off to a shrink or a psychiatrist because there's something obviously wrong in their lives, so they go to them. What those things teach, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to a, like a good Christian counselor because you can talk about a lot of things and get a lot of things off your chest, but what like a, usually a, a, a worldly, secular psychiatrist is going to teach you is ways of you know, suppressing your guilt and getting away from it so that way you don't have to deal with it. They want you to, they want you, uh, they want you uh, to hide that sin and say, you know what, you're not as bad as you think that you are, but yet you have that sin that's still there. These are all attempts at dealing with sin's guilt, and at the same time ignoring its reality. You may, you know, sit there and you know uh, realize, hey, it's a sin, but they're going to sit there and say, you know what, no, that, you know, just because the Bible says that it's a sin doesn't, you no, know, it's not really a sin. Everybody messes up. As long as sin can be treated as a a mistake or a sickness, there is no need to turn to God. And no need uh, for Jesus, no need for salvation, no need for the Bible, and no need for man to admit that he is a sinner. If we can sit there and just talk it away and, and, and convince ourselves that we're not the problem, that it's somebody else's issue, we don't need, uh, we don't know, uh, we don't need Jesus, the Bible, or anything else, because we're basically in a, in a strong delusion. I mean, think about it. If you look at the rich young ruler in uh, Matthew chapter 19, you can flip over there if you like. I'm going to stay in 1 John, so you keep your finger there. But we're going to flip over to Matthew uh, 19, and we're going to see the rich young uh, ruler. What was his problem? He didn't want to deal with those things that he needed to deal with. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 22. And it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good things shall I do? that I may have eternal life. That's his first problem. He says, what shall I do? What good things shall I do? He's depending upon himself, upon his works, upon him setting things straight and not you know, God setting things straight. It says, and he said unto them, why callest thou me good? There is none good but, but one, that is God. But if thou will enter into uh, life, keep the, uh, keep the commandments. So he, uh, Jesus knows immediately where to go. He knows that he's not keeping the commandments or anything else. He knows that the thing is, is that he's not right with the Lord. He's trying to get him to realize that, he, uh, you know, that he's not in that, you know, that he's been not keeping the commandments so that he's in, he's in sin. He says, he saith unto him, which Jesus said, thou shalt, uh, uh, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt commit uh, no adultery, or, yeah, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, Honor thy mother and thy father, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I can guarantee that these were all things this guy was going, uh, going through. These are all things that you know, God was dealing with. And we said, well, that guy murdered someone? No, the Bible says that if you hate someone, that that is murder. And you can go through all these ones, but I can guarantee that those are all the things that he was dealing with, but the guy was so blinded you know, to, uh, to himself, he convinced himself that he wasn't doing it. it says, and then the young man said, uh, uh, saith unto him, all these things uh, have I kept from my youth up. What lack I, uh, I yet? Jesus said unto him, if, uh, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have a treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. But when the young man heard uh, that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He finally hits the point, you know, to where he's actually able to see it, and the thing is, is that he doesn't want to get rid of it. And why is he sorrowful? Because he knows that he's doing these things, and the thing is, is that he wants to remain in that sin. He wants to remain greedy. He doesn't want to. He doesn't you know, want to be made right with God. He wants to stay right where he's at. And you'll you'll run into Christians that you know what their sin is that they need to get out of their life, and you have talked to them over and over and over again, and they will roll their eyes and say, you know what, that's not the problem. Like I said earlier, he says, "What uh, good thing shall I do?" He wants to work his way to heaven. He wants to pay. There's some people that will come to church. They come to church. I call them CEOs. Christmas, Easter only. 
And they come in, and they think, you know, I put $20 in the offering, I'm good. They think that that's going to make it, you know, that they, they've paid their way to heaven. i done enough good, you know, stuff. When I used to go to the, you know, false, you know, Catholic church, that's what my parents would do. They come in there as, you know, CEOs, we'd watch them, they put their $20 in. I learned from them, so I put, you know, whatever, thinking that I'm good, not realizing what the Bible says. We, we would rather pay or do stuff rather than what God says in order to, uh, to get eternal life, which is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We would rather uh, uh, you know, put our trust in our, in our money or our wealth. I mean, because anytime that we've gone uh, knocking door to door, we meet people that have money. You say, how do you know? They have a big house. They have nice cars. You talk to them. They don't, they don't go to church. They say, no, uh, we don't really need that right now. Why? Because they're putting their faith and their trust in all their money. People keep on going after money. They keep on going after wealth. They keep on going after those things. And you know what? And I'm not saying that you should not you know, work hard. You should not whatever. I'm saying don't put all your faith and your trust in those things. Put your full faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And then you can use that money you know, how it should be used. How God would have you to use it. Like God will bless you. And it says, there is no, none good but one. He has shown this man that there is no one who is righteous, no matter how good we think we are. And there are some people out there that will say, I, you know, I'm a good person. I don't do this. And they automatically you know, say these things. And these are things that are going to keep you away from that fellowship with the Father, that attitude. Jesus uh, you know, uh, gets to the heart of the matter because he was trying to open the eyes of this man who was spiritually blind. Here's you know, some of the world's viewpoints concerning dealing sin. This is the way the world deals with sin nowadays. Evolution. Man is on his way up. That he's getting better. Sin is not an issue. I mean, think about it. We put all of our faith and our trust in technology. And, 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 and I'm not, when I say this, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go see a doctor. But we put all of our trust in, in pharmaceuticals, in the doctors, in the medical field. We put all that before the fact that we, you know, we seek you know, God on a lot of those things. Or the fact that God has already provided a natural way of of, of getting healed. Do you think it's a good idea to keep on putting chemicals in your body that were not made for your body? Uh-oh, I had a, a sore subject. Everybody got quiet on that one. But think about it. We think we know better than God. And the best thing that we can come up with is that we have all for monkeys. Oh, wait, sorry, that's not it anymore. That the new, the new theory, you know, for evolution is the fact that there was a was a squid on a comet. Squid caught the comet, rode the comet, fell upon Earth, and we evolved from squid. If you can believe that, man, I, got, I tell you, I got some things, you know, that I got some, you know, uh, you know, some uh, well, pyramid schemes that I can, you know, I can show you and all kinds of fun stuff. I can show you some other schemes, I mean, deals. I mean, come on now. That's, just, that's like one of the dumbest things in the world is to sit there and think, that, you know, that uh, a squid came over. The other thing is, is in our education, that man can live without sin. That's what we're taught. You say, well, no, they're not. Yes, they are. Because they're taught, you know, a lot of times in education that they can blame others for their problems. I saw this the other day. I was watching, I was watching the news, and people in Chicago were mad because the illegals there were getting a um, a, a building so they could have, you know, free housing, they could have free, you know, uh, health care, they could have all this free stuff. But here's the kicker. It's not the fact that they were getting all this free stuff. It's the fact that the people on TV were saying, why aren't we getting that? So they were blaming somebody else, you know, all the illegals that are coming into the country, blaming them for them not getting the free stuff that they used to get through welfare. And we see this over and over, and that's what they're taught over and over and over and again. I mean, we see this, you know, uh, you know that the reason why, you know, the, there's this, you know, hatred towards, you know, uh, you know, the alphabet squad is because of the fact of that it's all the Christians' fault. Remember, you know, you know what happened in Nashville? And the transgender, you know, that got, you know, uh, went there and started shooting up, you know, the Christian school? You know who they blamed? Christians. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that transgender, it wasn't that transvestite. It was the fact that it was who? It was the Christian's fault because, you know, because the Bible says it. Because the Bible says, you know, that that's not right. And so it went from, 
you know, that person being a murderer to them being the victim. Science solve the problems and the mysteries of, of nature, and uh, and man can set uh, can be set from free, uh, set free from sin. In other words, it's always solving things with our intellect to make things worse. We think that we've made things better, but the things are getting worse. We find out, you know, oh yeah, try this or this or this. Try this, you know, this medicine or try this medicine or try this thing. It's going to make things better. No, it's not. It makes things worse. So, uh, in uh, sociology, sin is a byproduct of an unhealthy environment. Let me tell you this. Sin happens no matter what the environment. They want to say because people live in a poor community that crime rates are higher or there's more of a chance of crime happening because of the environment. I'm here to tell you that, you know, that people have murdered people that are billionaires. And they have money. So don't sit there and tell me that it's a product of their environment. It's the fact that, you know what, we're human, we sin, and then you know what, when sin runs rampant, that's what happens. Psychologically, they'll say, you know, talk about yourself long enough. I see those, you know, bill, big billboards on the, on the thing that says, be yourself. Be yourself. You know, be what? Yourself. What is that? I don't know. Just be yourself. But talk about yourself long enough and focus on what you need, and eventually you can eliminate your own guilt. Because it's, it's, the pro, you know, it's everybody else's fault, not mine. I'm the one that's in the right mind, but nobody will give me what I want. The idea of that there's nothing wrong with me. And finally on this one, religion. You say, well, I thought religion was a good thing. No. Learn the doctrines, practice the rituals, and do good, uh, good things, and you will feel better about yourself, and God will accept you. What's wrong with that, you know, uh, that, that ideology? You don't need Jesus. You don't need to go to church. You don't need any of that. It's all works-based because of the fact is, is it's all the stuff. I learn, you know, the doctrines. I kn- How many people have you, you said, you know, that you've met that, you, uh, that have come up to you and said, well, I went to church, I went to Sunday school, I know, you know what this doctrine teaches, I know this, you know, uh, this ritual, and I do a lot of good things for other people. I don't need to go to church. Why? Because I believe that I am, you know, where the church, you know, that I'm doing the Lord's work where I'm at. You don't, in other words, you're saying, I don't need God. We saw this last week, this was a, uh, I saw this this past week, we were watching uh, a show that I used to watch when I was a kid, Home Improvement. The kid on the show, you know, Randy, likes to, uh, he's, he's talking about, he says, I don't, you know, really believe about going to church. You know, there's a bunch of hypocrites in that church, and I don't really believe it. I said, I think I'm doing better good over here, you know, doing what I'm going to do. Well, the priest on the show comes up and says, but don't you think he's doing the Lord's work because he's doing good things, you know, just because, blah, blah, blah. And basically the whole, that you don't need, you don't need God, you don't need Jesus, you don't need any of that. All you have to do is do good. And did you notice, you know, what the big problem was with Randy's, you know, uh, thought? He says, I can't stand it because there's all all those hypocrites in that building. Who is he putting his faith and his trust in? Man. And he's disappointed in man. He's not putting his, his trust in the Lord or anything else. He's putting it in man saying they're a bunch of hypocrites. He is too. We all are in a lot of ways. But who are we trusting? Who are we putting our faith? I'm not saying that we should live a hypocritical life. I'm saying that there's times where, you know, we have been hypocritical, right? We're not perfect. None of these work because none of these deal with the problem of sin. After all is said and done, man is still a sinner. There is only one plan that works to remove the guilt of sin. Here's God's plan. Admit your sin... Trust God totally through Jesus Christ, his son, and he will remove both your sin and your guilt. And you know what? He will deliver you, and he's not going to cost $75 an hour to try and get you right. You say, well, that's just, it seems too easy. People don't like easy. They want complicated because they can trust in themselves to do it. They don't want to trust in God. How easy is it that if we come up and we would just admit our sin, trust God, Jesus Christ told you that he will remove both our sin and our guilt, and he will do it. That's what his word says. Number two, we must repent of our sins. If we will recognize our sin, 
and confess it to God and truly repent of that sin, he will absolutely forgive us and cleanse our lives. And you say, I don't, I don't know if that's true. Well, what does the Bible say? Hebrews 8.12 says, For I will be merciful to, the other, to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. He tells us right there, he says, he's going to be merciful to you. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for, uh, for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. He's the one that's going to blot them out. He's the one that's going to take away that, you know, that guilt and that sin you know, away from you. And he says right there, he says, I'm not going to remember them. After I blot them out, I'm not going to remember them. Isaiah 1, uh, 118, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be like wool. We know from this past week what, uh, what snow looks like. And God says, you know what, he wants to do that, that your skins, or, you know, sorry, that your sins were like crimson, were like red like scarlet. But he says, you know what, I'm going to make them white as snow. For some odd reason over the past couple of months, I've been telling my wife, and I know that it hadn't snowed. I know it hadn't snowed. And I was going, I told her right when I wake up in the morning, open up those blinds. I said, I know it didn't snow, but for some reason, I want it to be, I, I want it to be white when I open, that, uh, open up that blind in the morning. And she's like, but you know it didn't snow. I said, I know, but I, I still, for some reason, want that to happen. It did happen one time this week. So after all those couple of months or whatever, but the thing is, there's nothing more beautiful than looking outside at snow Remember, you're, I said looking outside, that means you're inside and warm. Looking outside and seeing the snow. Why? I think, you know, because, you know, deep down that we know that that's what Jesus Christ does to us when we confess our sins. And it's a good feeling. It's a good thing to know. We talked about this a little bit before, but what is repentance? It's to change one's mind or to turn away from it's a turn away. So, in other words, in repentance, like when you got saved, the Bible says, you know, to turn away from your unbelief and turn towards the belief in Jesus Christ. So what does that mean when you're already a saint, when you're already saved? It means the fact that when you repent, that what you're saying is, you know what, Lord, I need to change my mind about doing that stupid sin that, you know, that I keep doing over and over again and turn away from it. And what that oftentimes means is that you need to set yourself up for success instead of for failure. What do I mean? If you know you have, a, you know, say you have a problem with pornography, and you know that it's every single time that, you know, an authority figure leaves the house or somebody that can get you in trouble leaves the house, then you know what? How you set yourself up for success is that when that person leaves, you say, hey, can I go with you? Or you say, you know what? I got to go outside and do some yard work. That's setting yourself up for, for success because you know your shortcomings, Set yourself up, uh, up for success. If you know a certain person, and I know this one's a little bit more difficult, if you know a certain person is going to cause you to sin and cause you, you know, to go whatever, going to tell that bad joke where you're like, I know I shouldn't be laughing at this joke, but I, I just can't, whatever. When you see that person coming, go find something else to do. You say, well, that's kind of hard. They kind of follow. We'll just keep on going and say, hey, you know, I need to get back to work. Do whatever, you know, you can so that way you're not putting yourself back in that same position over and over again. When we repent, we leave our sin behind and walk away from it. Our sin is removed from us and guilt is replaced with peace and joy. When you walk away from that sin and you, say, uh, uh, you walk away from that, you repent of that sin, it is going to be replaced with peace and joy. Why? Because the guilt and shame is gone. And fellowship is restored. If we, uh, if we repeat that same, sin, uh, that same sin, ask Jesus to forgive you, turn away from it, like I said, set up a plan to overcome it by not putting yourself in that same situation again, then get, as I said last week, then get up off the, uh, off the mat and move forward. You have to move forward. You cannot sit there on the mat and be like, well, I'm still here. Because you're still wallowing in that sin. You need to realize it's not you that forgives sins. It's Jesus Christ that forgives your sins and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. When you realize that and you ask Jesus to forgive you of that and to cleanse you from that, get up off the mat 
and move forward. Move forward. Number three, we must reveal our sins. Verse 7 says this, if we, walk, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship uh, one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. The different, there's a difference between relationship and fellowship. There's a difference between a relationship and fellowship. I talked about it a little bit earlier, but I'm going to go back into it. Sin cannot undo a believer's relationship with God. Sin cannot undo a, relation, a believer's relationship with God, but it can destroy fellowship with God. Let me say that again. Sin cannot undo a believer's relationship with God, but it can destroy fellowship with God. Think about Adam and Eve. Adam in the garden. He, as I said earlier, walking with God in the cool of the day. He had... Not only the relationship with God, he had the fellowship and everything was great. Until sin entered and what ended up happening? He was kicked out of the garden. The relationship was still there, you know, still there with God. He was, you know, nothing, you know, removed his salvation, but the fellowship was broken. And we have to restore, uh, we have, uh, we're talking about obviously this morning about having that fellowship with God. Many believers are attempting to hide their sin in their life. They have sinned, and they act as if everything is okay, that everything is all right. Oftentimes, if you, you, know, you can walk up to somebody and say, how are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. And all the while, they have all the sin and guilt and shame because they don't want to deal with it. I'm not saying you should blurt it out to every single person that you come. Like, yeah, I did this. I'm such a you know, wicked sinner. Because the thing is, you, for number one, all, all you want is somebody's pity for you about what you did. But they're, they can't forgive you of your sin anyways. Now, if you've done it towards somebody, then yes, you need to reconcile that. The Bible says that if, you ha, you know, if there is a sin between you and your brother, be reconciled. And he's talking about communion. Well, isn't communion and fellowship about the same thing? That you need to go to your brother, you know, go to your sister in Christ and say, you know what, I have wronged you, I have done these things. If they, uh, if they uh, think that everything is all right, they're lying to themselves. And they're lying to others, and ultimately they're lying to God. Eventually, they will begin to believe the lie themselves. At that point, they deny their sin, and by uh, doing so, call God a liar. You say, well, I would never call God a liar. Look at verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So any... You know, unconfessed sin that we have is the fact of us saying that, you know what, God, you're a liar. You say, well, how am I calling him a liar? Because we don't believe that he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, as he talks about in the uh, verses prior to, the, uh, prior to this. The thing is, is that there's a, a quote that has been actually credited to many people. I have accredited it to Hitler because that's what um, I've heard it all the time, but then I, I did a search on it, and apparently a lot of people have made the same kind of comment, and it's referred to as the big lie which is repeat a lie often enough and people will believe it. Well, if we repeat that lie to ourselves over and over again, eventually we're going to believe it. And the thing is, is that when we, do, uh, when we believe that lie, we don't know what the truth is anymore or what the lie is. You know, it's a lot, a lot harder to get through life trying to remember the lies and how, you know, and how to piggyback off of it than it is to just tell the truth. I, you know, that is one thing, you know, not only for adults, but also kids need to realize. Kids, tell the truth. Because a lie is far worse. You say, well, how worse is it? Because you have to remember, you know, how you lied the last time in order to cover it. And then you got to remember that lie, and then you got to remember that lie, and then you got to remember that lie, and then you got to remember that one. And you're going, what was the truth? If we were just told the truth and let it be out there, yes, there might be consequences for it. But you know what? All the guilt and shame that we have from constantly lying because one lie builds off another lie. It's just easier, you know what, to say, you know what? Tell the truth. And this is extreme, you know, it's, doesn't this, doesn't this sound like, you know, doesn't the big lie sound like something that Satan would do to keep believers out of fellowship with the Father? Satan, you know, if he can't take away your relationship, he's going to try and make you 
you know, uh, to where you cannot stand up anymore. He's going to try and keep you out of the game on the sidelines as long as possible. If he can get, you know, uh, keep telling you that lie over and over again and you keep on listening to it over and over and over again, he's going to keep you out, out of fellowship and you're, not, you're no longer hearing you know, what you know, the Lord would have for you, but you're hearing you know, what Satan would have for you. But if we would just listen to the truth of God's word, because what happens when we start believing a lie or stay in sin? We start getting away from God's word. Because we don't feel like we're good enough to read God's word. We don't feel like we're good enough for God to speak to us. We don't feel like, you know, that there's anything in there, you know, that's going to help us anymore. And we get to that point where we're not reading anything. Then all of a sudden we're not going to church or anything else. And you say, well, pastor, that seems like a slippery slope. It is a slippery slope. That's why the Bible wants us to deal with sin immediately. So we don't allow allow it to get to that point. You will never prosper with hidden sin in your life. Proverbs 28, 13 says, he that, uh, he that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy. Amen, right? It says you cannot cover your own sin because you're not going to prosper because all that guilt and everything else, there's nothing else you're going to do because you don't have God's forgiveness. It says, but if you confess it and forsake it or leave it, you're going to find mercy. Why? Because you're trusting in God to do those things. I mean, think about this. Light reveals error, or light re- uh, reveals stumbling blocks. Anybody, anybody knows this one if you try to walk into a room at night with no lights on. I've stubbed many a toe on, on many a chair. I've stepped on Legos. I've stepped on a whole bunch of things. Because, you know what, if I were to turn the light on, I'm like, but I know where it's at. I know where it is. I don't need to turn the light on. Come back battered and bruised. But you know what the amazing thing is? You flip the light on, and you're like, oh, well, why is that in the floor? Oh, yes, because I left it there. This is why many people don't like to attend church regularly. You say, well, how's that? Because their sin is exposed by the light of of the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uh, brings conviction upon their heart. And they are forced to see their sin For what it actually is. It's an abomination to God. It's an insult to God. People fear exposure, so they stay away from the light. People don't want, they don't want to come to church. They don't want to, you know, to hear preaching. They don't want to hear any of that. Why? Because they're afraid that God's going to, you know, how many times have you ever been to church and somebody say, well, pastor, you spoke exactly what I needed to hear. I've had people come up to me and say, pastor, how did you know that this was what I was going through? And I'm like, this is in my notes. I have no idea what's going on in your life. It's called God's Word. It's living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. That it knows the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God's Word's going to speak. And that's why people, you know, they'll start going to church for a while and then all of a sudden sin starts happening and they get away from church. Why? Because sin starts happening and they don't want to get, they don't want to get rid of it and they don't want it to be reveal, sorry, revealed so they can deal with it and so God can deal with it. There are two kinds of conviction. General uh, there are you know, two kinds of conviction, general and specific. General is a feeling of guilt for no particular reason. It's usually satanic. You ever had those you know, times where you're just sitting there and you're like, I feel guilty about this. And you're like, why? I don't know. And it's true. You're like, I don't know. I'm like, I just feel guilty for some odd reason. I don't know why. But usually there's some sort of you know, satanic thing going on you know, that just wants to get you down because of something that you said. But specific is always, and that one, uh, the general one is usually satanic. Specific is usually God. Oh, sorry, is always God. Specific is always from God's Spirit. God desires to fellowship with you as with a son or a daughter. He calls you to, uh, in a direct fashion, revealing specific sin. God wants to deal with that sin to get it out of your life so that way fellowship can be restored. Before sin can be dealt with, it must be exposed to the light. So what have you been hiding Whatever it is, be, no, uh, be uh, notice or know that God already knows, and he wants you to get honest. Number four, we must relate our sin. We must relate our sins. Verse nine, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's the fact that we must confess those things. What's confession? It's simply naming your sin to God, specifically in agreeing with him 
concerning the nature of that sin. Present tense. So what do you do? God, I'm sorry. I have been lying to you. That's how you would say it to God in short and in easy. I have been lying to you in this matter. Or I've been looking at this, you know, Lord. Or I've done this. Or I've done that. That's how you deal with it. Sin ought to be uh, confessed immediately. I mean, think about it. You wouldn't wait all day to get an eyelash out of your eye, would you? I mean, how many of you like having an eyelash in your eye? Isn't that a wonderful feeling? I mean, I'm guessing that if the eyelash stays in your eye long enough, it could you know, become infected. So why do you keep sin in your life just because you don't want to deal with it? I mean, I go to Brother Doug, if I, you know, after a while, if I couldn't get it out. If I couldn't get that eyelash out of my eye, I'd, I'd, I'd go right to him. A true spirit-filled uh, life is not one that is sinless. A true spirit-filled life is not one that's sinless. It is a life lived in close fellowship with God. In other words, the fact is, is that when sin happens, you confess it immediately. Do you want to know why people have roller coasters? experiences they have that spiritual roller coaster that they go up like this and they come down and they're up like this and then oftentimes you know uh they feel like it has to be happened at a conference or some sort of concert or some sort of convention that they went to or whatever do you know why it happens at those things because god's being shown in those places and the people can't whatever and then all of a sudden they're like oh i need to get rid of uh, i need to get rid of that thing the same thing happens here at church but the thing is is that what do you expect when you come to church do you expect god to speak to you some don't some come to this place and don't expect God to speak to them at all. But when they go to a convention or some kind of special event, they're like, they expect God to speak and to deal with them. That's why sometimes when you try to get somebody to go to a special event, they're like, oh, no. But if you come in here a week in and a week out, and you're like, you know what, I don't expect what pastor has to say to apply to my life. I don't expect God's word to ever apply to my life. God's not going to, you know, nothing's going to happen. But eventually, God's going to have that, you know, God's going to speak to you, and you're going to have to deal with it. Are you going to ignore it or confess it? Don't have that roller coaster experience of being, you know, having that high and then coming down, oh, oh, you know, constantly. Get rid of the sin that's in your life. If we would learn the principle of instant confession, we would live more consistent lives. If we would live, if we would learn the principle of instant confession, that when we mess up, we realize it, that we confess it, we would live more consistent lives. But the sad thing is that there are people that have mountains of unconfessed sin lying around like dirty laundry in the corners of our hearts. How many? How many of? I don't know if I want to ask that question of how many. I was going to say it this way. Or actually, I'm going to say how many, but I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. How many of you like to go into your laundry room and have mountains upon mountains upon mountains of dirty laundry? Like I'm talking like eight, ten loads. And you walk in there and you look at it and you're defeated before you even start. Or you walk in there and you just go, and you're like, I'll deal with it another day. Some of us need to realize that mountains and mountains of dirty laundry you have is that sin in your life, and eventually you just need to get started. You need to start confessing it. Why? Because the only thing you're doing is hurting yourself by allowing another load of laundry to get on there, another load of laundry, another load of laundry, another load of laundry. And you could use that to any area, you know, or, you know, for those that, you know, dishes are a wonderful thing. Think about all the dishes that, you know, they keep on stacking up on there, and you can feel defeated. Or the fact that you haven't done yard work. You can go out there and look at the yard work and go, man, when am I going to get to that? You've got to start somewhere. Start confessing it. Start confessing those things, in, you, know, uh, you know, those areas where you know that you've sinned. Ask God to forgive you. Ask him to cleanse you, and he will. And you move on to the next. And then you move on to the next. Get up off the mat and move forward. Number five, we must, and this is finally, we must rest in the Lord. Let's look again at verse 9. It says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
Here's the best news in the world for the Christian, is that there is a place where we can deal with our sins, a place where our guilt can be exchanged for peace. You know what? All men are looking for such a place. For a Christian, we know where to go. We know uh, that we should go to Jesus Christ, that he can give us that peace that surpasses all understanding. But man in general is looking, you know, they're looking for a place, but oftentimes, where do they go? Where do they seek? They look for it in false religions. They look for it in drugs. They look for it in alcohol. They look for it in money. They look for it in, 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 you know, in any other way than Jesus Christ. But you know what? Jesus offers to forgive us of our sins freely. It is in his blood, and Jesus is the answer. It's that, you know, that, that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is only found in him. You cannot find it for, through Buddha. You can't through, find it through Muhammad. You can't find it you know, through Confucius. You can't find it through anyone else but Jesus Christ. If you want peace, go to Jesus Christ and confess it. Confess those, uh, confess those sins. The Bible says that he is faithful. That means that he, is, he always forgives and he always cleanses. Always. There's never a time where God does not forgive or you know, that God does not cleanse. No matter how often you come, he will receive you and he will cleanse you. Here's the other thing. He also forgets. You say, well, what? God forgets? Yes. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he taken or he removed our transgressions from us. It says he's just. He blots out our sin and declares us not guilty. He will never hold it over us again. Whatever that sin was that you confessed to him and you asked him for forgiveness, he's not going to hold it over your head. You say, well, I still feel like it's over my head. That's because Satan's there and he is the accuser of the brethren. He doesn't want you to feel like you're free, but you are. The Bible says in Romans chapter 4, verse 24, it says, But for us also, speaking of Christians, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised, uh, raised up Jesus uh, our Lord from the dead. So the fact is, is that, you know what? Who is it imputed to? Our sin is imputed to Jesus Christ, not to us. He bore his, you know, our sins in his body. He took our sins upon him. And you know what? He will do it for whosoever will. It's not just for a special few. It is for whosoever will. John chapter 6, verse 37 says, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. What does no wise cast out? He's not going to cast you out. There's no way he's going to cast you out. It says that if you come to him, he's not going to cast you out. This is the same thing that it is for salvation, that if you come and say, Jesus, save me, he's not going to be like, no, get out of here. I don't want you. It's the same thing for when you sin, that if you come to him and confess that sin and you ask him for forgiveness and cleansing, he's not going to say no. He's going to do it. Why? Because it's in his character to do it. His word says it. He's not a liar. The devil is a liar. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will, what? Give you rest. Revelation chapter 20, verse 17, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and, uh, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. God wants you to be free. He wants to have that fellowship with you. But you must confess those sins. You can't have sins in your you know, life that you don't want to get rid of. You, know, uh, you have to confess them. Now, are you going to be perfect? No. But that's why there's that instant, um, that instant you know, uh, confession that we should be doing. That when we realize that we've sinned, confess it. Confess it. So that way our fellowship can be as complete as it possibly can be on this earth. How many of you would love to have that constant Fellowship with the Lord. I think every, I would hope everyone in this room would say, yes, that's what I want. Then don't hold on to that unconfessed sin. All it's doing is hurting you. I conclude with this. The first and primary step, the first step toward fellowship with God is 
admitting that you've sinned. You see, you cannot save or, or, or cleanse yourself, uh, nor cleanse yourself. Jesus has already done the work. You can't, you can't cleanse, you can't save, you can't do anything for yourself. God has, uh, God has already done that for you. Jesus has done the work. He simply asks for you to respond to him by faith. Do you believe in faith that God can forgive you? That God can cleanse you? When you do, when you believe by faith that he could do it, when you do that, you will, uh, you will be received, forgiven, cleansed, and in fellowship with him. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what anybody wants? Some of God's children need to come home this morning. Some people that have been in a backslidden state for years need to come home this morning. You've wandered far and you're carrying that load of guilt and that there is no, you know what, there is no need to do that any longer. Jesus wants to relieve that load. Some have never trusted Jesus Christ for salvation. And I would say this, please don't go to hell when God has made a way that you can freely and eternally be saved from your sins. Don't you want to walk in fellowship with the Lord? You can, but you must come His way. This morning, if there is something you know, uh, that you have uh, that is unconfessed sin, something that, you've know, you know, that you need to get rid of, something that you know that the Holy Spirit has been convicting you about over and over again, don't wait any longer. Come to Him now and get it. Over the next few minutes, if that's you, you say, you know what, Pastor? You know, I have this, un, you know, I have this unconfessed sin. I've been backslidden. I want to come to him. Come. Don't make excuses because the devil's going to tell you to stay in your chair. The devil's going to say you don't need to do that. The devil's going to you know, do everything in his power. And then you know what's going to happen? You're going to go out there in the parking lot and leave and sit in your car and go, you know what? I should have done it. But I can't do it now. There's nothing else I can do. I can never be forgiven. I should have done it. I missed my chance. That's what's going to happen. Do you know why I know that? Because the devil tells me the same thing that he tells you. He lies, and you know what? He does it the same exact way. The devil doesn't want you to be free. He doesn't want you to have that fellowship. So this morning, if, whether you've been a, you know, a believer for years and you've backslidden, come. Get that forgiveness, that cleansing this morning. If you're a sinner, you say, you know what, I've never given my life to Jesus Christ, come, and he will do that for you. So come now.